With me is the director, writer, and cast of the movie Hero Tomorrow. It is actually an independent superhero film that is premiering tonight at Comic-Con. It's the first film project I've really worked on. I think this is probably the best venue we could have hoped for ever. We are checking out Chris Gore's favorite films from the Comic-Con Film Festival. Well, let's start with some of the picks. You brought the best of the best. Yes. Well, Hero Tomorrow. The cool thing about this movie really is how ambitious it was on such a low budget. I mean, they made this film in Ohio for dirt money. From the films you've been watching most online, here's our pick. It's from Ohio-based filmmaker and comic book fanatic Ted Sikora. Since premiering at Comic-Con, it's run the festival circuit and hits Montreal's Fantasia Festival in July. I come up with this idea, what would happen if a regular person really tried to become a superhero? Kind of a cross between Spider-Man and Taxi Driver. And it's sort of on the surface, very much a typical girl wants boy to make a commitment and get serious about his life and get a real job and grow up. When we finished our script, which took three years to write, that was the same year I was getting married, and there was no attempt to try to plan a wedding and shoot a movie at the same time. So I took that year and just storyboarded. My goal was to do a page a day. By the end of the year, I had 1,500 images. It's really one of the areas where I feel like I learned filmmaking. There was a general audition notice, so I went and auditioned. I think it was at a North Coast Central casting. I show up, and there was a lot more people there than I was used to seeing. I had made a short narrative film down at Ohio University with another cast member, Rick Montgomery. He was carrying around the trailer for this short film we did of Greasy Lake. And I apparently flash on there for a second. Ted saw it and was like, there's our mom. I figured this is the big time. I'm going to be famous. I want to make some money. This, this is big stuff. So I asked him, I mean, I didn't want to be rude, but I says, uh, how much am I getting paid? And he says, uh, nothing. Next question. I met these guys years ago uh, auditioning for a musical, Nothing Like Vaudeville. I got the mother of the freak part. I was a referral, yeah, and I think, and this has gotten me jobs before, I think because I could play the guitar and the fact that I was a long hair. I met Ted and his wife, Diane. Uh, they were shopping for a Christmas tree and uh, I was also shopping there, and I says, well, I have a truck, let me run it home for you. Ted and Diane both asked me what I did, and I says, I was a welder. I was retired, just enjoying life, and Ted says, have you ever done any theater? And I said, oh, yes, I have. Here are Tomorrow Comics, this is Robin speaking. Larry! Who is it? Your jackass friend. Robin was a really tough type. She has to be able to do this range of emotions, and she has to look like she belongs in a comic shop. When I first read the script for Hero Tomorrow, I was actually really impressed with the character Robin because she is such a powerful and dynamic character. There's a lot of levels to her, uh, so I knew as an actress that was going to be a really good challenge. The demands on her were extraordinary to my mind, particularly for a film set. I mean, a lot of really heightened emotion. And on camera, she'd be yelling and all frustrated in, the, in character. And then as soon as it would be done, the camera would stop and she would just like start cracking up at herself. I was doing a show at Cleveland Public Theater called The Cult and uh, sitting in the audience one of the evenings was Ted Sikora and he approached me afterwards and asked me if I'd like to come and read for a feature film. I first met with Perrin. We did a brief read through and I remember thinking, wow, this is a very intense person and just intense eyes and just very intense presence about him. If we took a misstep with David, the film was over. He had that kind of lanky, wiry, geeky, action figure kind of uh, energy. Really beautiful, dread, locky, long hair that you probably would like to run your fingers through it, but I don't know if you can do that with dreadlocks. There was just nothing he didn't want to try. There were a lot of things he wanted to try that we were afraid to let him try. Perrin's hilarious. He's everything you want in an acting partner because he is spontaneous to a fault. He'd bring that out in you, too, because if he's believable, I can almost play off it like it was a regular conversation. Where's Obama? Is that it? 
you know, not Obama. Right. <laughs> Grandpa, where's uh, Ob- Obama? No, come on. Uh, uh, Rama? What's an Obama? First it was the coyote, and, and then Cobra Man, and what is this? A Puma? What is this a, a shit? Palma. A Palma. A Palma. A Palma. Well, I never did get it right. <laughs> Even It was a word I sort of thought I made up. It was back in the 80s when we were trying to think of a name for our band. The look of a Palma, just in drawing form, kind of comes from my days as a, you know aspiring comic book artist. The costume had gone through a few changes. A guy who worked with us in nothing like vaudeville, Kevin James, came on and kind of got us sort of the leotard. He got us the fur. And then we got another costumer involved. She sort of made the mask. She sewed the fur onto the face. At that point, I think Milo described it as looking a bit like a mummy. So then Perrin actually got the costume and airbrushed some viney, branch-like textures. Then we decided it still needed a little more of a punch. And then Alexandra Underhill was introduced to me. I'm the costume designer of a performance troupe. And comic book heroes or comic book characters are a really easy format or context for me. And it was really simple to just kind of concentrate on certain areas to make the overall visual impact a lot stronger. So for example, we did the knee to the ankle, we did the wrist to the elbow, and then we did across the chest. The dreadlocks, that was not written into the character. You know, that was something that kind of grounded a Pama in the earth. I mean, I know it's gonna be okay. The preview guide has some fighting mind trap three months from now, but I wonder. How are they going to bring him back? Time travel. Or a clone. Dream sequence. A parallel universe. Resurrection. An illusion. Twin brother. Damn. <laughs> I attended a couple Comic Cons with Ted actually, uh, just to get a feeling for the different types of costume and makeup, um, maybe attitude that I needed to bring to Robin. We have tons of valuable comics that are essentially worthless because they've been read to shreds. My association with comic books is um, pretty much none. I haven't missed Amazing Spider-Man since the early 70s. I'm not a comic book geek, so I wasn't real familiar with it, but I had worked in bookstores, so. You know, that was a vacant storefront. We had to run a huge truck to get these massive shelves over there. The independent comic book community really rallied around us, and we were able to get a lot of donated posters and books to stock our comic shop. We were also able to make it look exactly like we wanted a comic shop to look. It looked so real that regular people off the street kept coming in there constantly asking if they could buy anything. That was Milo's job to keep all the patrons out of the store. I could never figure out what Joe was doing from one day to the other. I did a lot of the lighting, the audio recording. Helped out with actually a little bit of the makeup, and um, the movie's awesome because of it. (laughs) (laughs) Nicely done. If you take all of us in the crew, I'm talking about Milo, my brother, Joe, and Rob, and myself, I think we probably had about five days of set experience combined. We have this sibling rivalry that we're always trying to outdo each other like brothers do. I don't think you can tell who's shooting one scene compared to the next. I like Ted's directing style in that he's very open to collaboration. He also likes to talk down to you, almost like, hi, you're not a human being, I am. Welcome. Intimidation is probably the first thing that probably hit me. Wanting to act in a professional manner, not knowing what a professional film actor is supposed to do. But then I came to really appreciate, wow, man, you can just stay right here. You can just be David. You can be a Palma. Don't worry about anything else. That's your job. This is really, really fun and comfortable, and let's make a kick-ass movie. And in terms of everybody else, I think what interests me about the film is that, you know, they are surrounded by such locals that do in their way not just seem stuck, but actually seem really satisfied, which is part of, I think, the truth of it. I always saw Greg as not really a bad person or a villain. He's always getting ditched. He feels like if he gives you a chance and he trusts you, you should give him respect. I would completely have been just as annoyed as Greg was with David. If you love me, hang your pierogi in the window. I got a lot of kidding about that song because of the music I've done in the past. He's very serious in the movie. Offset, he is telling one joke after another. It, it must have been uh, David, that, uh, that son of a bitch. Well, we came to use my house because Ted said, well, we were kind of looking for a place for Robin's character to live, you know, in your studio, you know, since Robin's a fashion designer, your studio would be perfect. 
And I was like, oh great, and I'm gonna be going to Burning Man this summer, so here, have my keys and do whatever you want to my house. The scene I was most concerned about shooting was the dinner scene. We need to learn a lot about what a Pama means to David. We need to learn about Robin and her mother. It's got, a, I think, a lot of dimension. I think it's got mother protecting the daughter, particularly protective because of her daughter's psychological difficulties, mother testing the boyfriend. There's also something I've talked about when I've directed theater, which is if there's three people in the room, it's always two against one. The song that we played in the film was uh, Lost and Gone. I wrote that about my father. He passed away um, in 2001. The song's just kind of about, you know, people think of all the things that you didn't get to do with, you know, whoever passed away. Ooh, she just got a ramp right up my fucking ass. The guy who played Zeke? Yeah. Zeke. I don't know, that guy's a character. I think even during the scene, like, my face hurt. I was laughing my ass off the whole time. <laughs> if my memory is correct, uh, Ted told me there was a character they were going to kind of make for me. So the part about the family and the single dad and the being aggravated, uh, that's me all day. I was in the middle of a move and Ted was more thrilled with that than anything. He was like, you're kidding me. Let's throw your stuff in the car and use it as a set. My dog was there. The space we shot in was that very old concert club, the Fantasy, and it was the upstairs. Kind of like in the backstage area type deal where you know, God only knows what's happened back yeah. there or uh, what children's been conceived back there <laughs> or any of that sort. And it is tagged, tagged, and tagged. I think somebody tagged the shower. I mean, everywhere you turned, there was tagged. The one thing I do remember that I really don't get is uh, this Iron Maiden Eddie reference. I am not a hard rocking guy. I have no idea what that is. And to this day, I wonder if I even, uh, you know, enunciated it right or... What the fuck, is this your Iron Maiden Eddie? You are who? I'm a Pama. Scourge of evildoers the world over. I think it's Scourge. Huh? It's not Scourge, it's Scourge. Well, what the hell is an Apama? It's from mythology. Like Greek mythology? No, no. The Halloween party was probably my favorite part of the whole extravaganza. I liked the location we shot it. It was a great group of people we got together. You had some models there, which is always nice. And uh, I was in a ridiculous outfit that brought much mirth to the proceedings for all involved, including myself once I kind of gave over to it. You know? <laughs> I was very happy and proud that, as I suggested in the, in the famous vomiting scene, I said I was going to do this in one take. And uh, we, we did it, you know, we shot it in one take. Ray said what? One take. That's funny, because I remember another take. You're really concerned about the fight. I was not granny, I was junior. I oh. didn't buy that freaking costume. Right, right, right. 300 bucks? What? Yeah. You puking ass motherfucker. Hey. You ought to pay half of it. Why? Your fault. Where the shit is David? <laughs> <laughs> that fucker stole over $700 of my dad's money, and I'm gonna bash it out of his ass. Get out of here. Shut Wait, up, comic boy. Listen. <laughs> Look, why don't you just go ahead and grab that mower up there and get started? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm supposed to be yelling at David and telling him about his piece of junk car. You spent the money on your little piece of junk car, didn't you? Piece of junk yeah, your car. piece of cunt jar! Dead. It gives me <laughs> ah, fuck! Piece of cunt jar. <laughs> piece of... You know, this not paying for food is nonsense. <laughs> Did your mama give you that booty? <laughs> Shut up! Lair, 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 lair. What in the hell?
got, you got me cheating. <laughs> Here's a DVD extra special feature to your head. Try cleaning the toilet for a scene. There we go. Oh. <laughs> All right. I think any time that I got to actually jump around and be this superhero of Palma, whether it be jumping out of some rafters, falling through a barn door, running through the woods, it left me room to create, to explore, to go back and say, wow, I remember drawing comic books and going through all those images, and man, these are the styles, these are the poses, this is what you do. A favorite of mine is just the scene we shot, you know, with my daughter. That was a real special moment for me, and I was, I was really glad we were able to, to work that in. My favorite scene in the movie to shoot was actually a scene that we ended up adding a little while later. It's a scene between Robin and David where they're just futzing around with a Polaroid camera. A lot of the dialogue between the two of us was just kind of ad-libbed and it was really natural and it was just a lot of fun to do. The day I shot at the junkyard, I know for a fact I was hungover. Ted gave me this address to, to meet him and he told me don't wear anything that I'm ever going to want, need, or, or care about again. And going into the bowels of a parts place, uh, everybody's gone in and seen six guys with a blue shirt on and they punch a computer, but you don't know where they go. You don't know what's back there. We were back there. And then there was the thing where I dropped the, the uh, F-bomb of all F-bombs. Motherfucker. Really yell, I want, I want the place to shake. Motherfucker. Scare me, all right? Motherfucker! <laughs> I think I pulled something, screaming for that F-bomb. I'm attracted to just the weird stuff, too. I mean, the squid thing, I have. To, I still don't know what it means. I still don't know. I still, I'm like, I love that this is in here. Like, my favorite part's the squid part. It's gotta be. Chaffee, he's got that red robe on, and he says, and now this story of the squid, and then there's that awesome puppet. What was the squid scene all about? Yeah. What was that all about? Ted called me on the phone and said, Hey, I had this dream, and he wrote this poem, and he tells me the squid story, and I was just dumbfounded. I think, um, I, you know, what is going on? I, I think it was a, an erotic dream of this self-reliance and self-abuse that manifested itself in a film that... People always ask me about the squid scene and what does it mean, and I just don't understand what is not to understand. You know what, if you're a squid and you're squishy and you're out of water, you know, he still gave it a go. He just didn't sit there like a lump. He had a hat and a monocle, and I think he tried his hand at love, didn't he? And who doesn't relate to that? I've always considered Hero Tomorrow sort of the punk rock version of the big budget superhero film. You know, I've seen some of the big uh, superhero things this summer. The effects are extraordinary, and I've enjoyed them, but among the many key things I ask myself as an actor, or I ask my students when they're acting, is to what end? And ultimately, things really interest me if, when I can find the answer to what end, I find a compelling human problem. I think it's a really refreshing take because it's not big budget, it's not all these special effects, it's not all these special powers, it's a real person trying to be a real hero, even if it ends up being ridiculous or he's pulling all these stunts and he's trying his hardest and it's just not working. So I think it's a nice counter to what's going on with the bigger superhero films. We got into a lot of great festivals, which I think is amazing, especially in this era where there's so many films competing to get into those. So my first time seeing it was at the San Diego Comic-Con. This is really an honor to be able to show at the San Diego Comic-Con, and I think we couldn't have really asked for a better place to have our premiere showing. One of the best things that happened for us early on was we got a great review on Newsarama. Then we went to Montreal. Santa Fe, which is a real up-and-coming festival. Played Akron. The festival moment that really sticks out for me was uh, at Fantasio, actually when we were picked up at the airport, and Lloyd Kaufman was also to be picked up with Milo and I. My favorite viewing, though, is when we actually came back home to do the Cleveland International Film Festival. Seeing Hero Tomorrow all laid out and on the big screen, first of all, was one of the most exciting days of my life. You're sitting next to all your friends. Man, that was, that was fucking awesome. Yeah. And the lady behind me says, to her husband, the guy in front of you is the guy on the screen. 
And he said, yeah, he's got the same shirt on. I loved it because it seems to be never ending. I have not done any independent film that just kept resurfacing after festival after festival, and I will just forget. I'll get an email and I'll go to the website and go, oh my gosh, these six things happened since last time I thought about this film. I just love it. This is something that is very memorial to me. That it's really like a family. It's been like a second family to me. It was, it was a bit of a life-changing experience. And it's like the, the status of, you know, being in a movie, I guess, you know. Uh, not to like, mention it's a pretty good pickup line to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to work around the coolest group of people, made tons of friends that I don't ever talk to or hang out with or ever see that I haven't seen in three years. It was all a good time and it was fun and I enjoyed spending time with everybody uh, except for Joe. Or, or does he ever find an Apama? I don't think he's going that route. Uh, I don't know, that would be a great 100th issue. Well, how does he even know what one looks like? A new idea that emerged was how fun would it be to actually produce the comic book that was in David's head. We've launched Apama, the undiscovered animal. This tells the story of Cleveland's resident superhero. It's been pointed out to us that we've done this sort of ass backwards where, you know, we did first a movie and now the comic book, but we love doing it and it just keeps ending with to be continued.